it was time for them to head to Jerusalem. So they started south, down the far side of the Jordan River. As usual, people chased after him. And, as usual, he took the opportunity to teach them. Along the way, some more religious leaders wanted to discuss divorce with him in an effort to build a case against him. Is it okay for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses teach in the Torah? Moses said it was okay. As long as the husband put it in writing. Do you know why Moses said that? He knew you were going to dump your wives anyway, whether he agreed or not. So the best he could do was get you to formalize the agreement in writing. But it's not the way Yahweh intends things to be. Yahweh created males and females with the intention that a man would marry and leave his parents permanently. The couple would cease to be two separate people and they would grow to become one life together until death. So I'm telling you that what Yahweh has joined together should not be separated, not even on the basis of some rule you got from Moses. Back in the house, the disciples asked for a further explanation. My rule is that if you divorce your wife for any reason and marry someone else, you are committing adultery by doing that. If a woman does the same thing and then remarries, she is also guilty of committing adultery. Simple as that. Parents were bringing their children to Yeshua, hoping that he would touch them, and his disciples criticized those who did it. But when Yeshua saw it, he was quite upset. Let them come. Don't stop them. We can learn much about Yahweh's kingdom from these little children. In fact, if you do not become like one of them, you will not be allowed into this new kingdom that I am building. So he picked the children up and hugged them, blessing them as had been requested. One day when he was out walking, someone came running after him. The man knelt down in front of Yeshua. Good teacher, I've heard that you can make people live forever. Tell me what I must do to get this. First, you have called me good, but you must understand that no human opinion should come in the way of knowing what Yahweh wants you to do. You have his rules there in the Torah for starters. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not lie, honor your father and mother. But teacher, I've obeyed all these rules from the time I was a child. The man had interrupted before Yeshua could say the last commandment, the one about greed. Yeshua loved him and wanted him to see his need more clearly. Ah, but you've missed one thing, and that is the source of all your problems. You must go and sell everything you have and give to the poor. When you do that, you will have the treasure in heaven that you're looking for. Then you will be free to come die with me. The young man walked away sorrowfully because he had too much wealth to want to give it all up. Then Yeshua looked around at those who were with him. Do you see this? It's like this with anyone who is wealthy. It's not easy for any of them to get into the heavenly kingdom. The disciples were astonished, as this was the first time they had heard him say this. I'll say it again. It is extremely difficult for those who think money will solve their problems to get into the heavenly kingdom that I am building. I would go so far as to say that it would be easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into Yahweh's kingdom. They discussed this amongst themselves, realizing that virtually everyone assumes they need money to live. Was you trying to say that no one can be saved? I am saying that without help from Yahweh, yes, it would be impossible for anyone to be saved. But with Yahweh... There is a way. Then Peter thought back to the day when he started following Yeshua. Aha, I see it now. That is what we did, isn't it? We left everything and started traveling around with you. Exactly. And as a result, even in this life, you've experienced Yahweh's provision day after day. We've stayed in many homes and you've discovered hundreds of spiritual brothers and sisters that you never knew you had just because you were prepared to leave what you had before and come with me. We received persecution too, but in the end, we will have eternal life. Just be careful that you do not become lifted up with pride about this, for some of the first converts may finish up lost, and some of the last to change may be the ones with the most truth in the end. They were still heading toward Jerusalem, 
and Yeshua was walking well ahead of the others, as though he was in a hurry to get there. This surprised the others, because they understood that trouble awaited them all when they arrived. Yeshua had been preparing them by sharing as much as he felt they could take in. So when we reach Jerusalem, someone is going to help the religious leaders capture me, and then the religious leaders will, in turn, get the Romans to execute me. But on the third day after I am executed, I will rise back to life. Much of it still went over their heads, because they still had an unrealistic picture of this coming kingdom. Listen to this request from James and John to get an idea of how selfish they still were. Teacher, can we ask a favor from you? What is it that you want? When you set up your kingdom, can we have the top positions with one of us seated just to the right of you and the other seated just to the left? Oh dear. Do you even know what it means to be great in my kingdom? Can you drink the cup of my suffering and be baptized with everything that I must go through? Oh yes, certainly. Can't we, James? Yes. Yes, Master. We can do that. You may not understand it now, but you will suffer. And one of you will die for me too. But I'm not in a position to say who will sit on my right hand or who will sit on my left. That will be decided later. When word leaked out that they had done this, the other ten disciples were pretty angry with James and John. So Yeshua called them all together and addressed the problem. You know that in the world, being a leader means being able to tell other people what to do. But it's not going to be like that with us. If you want to be great, you have to show it by serving the others. Look at me. I didn't come to be waited on by the rest of you. No. I've tried to serve you and to give my life as payment for the sins of others. Shortly after this, they arrived in Jericho. Along the way, a lot of people had started walking with them. As they were leaving Jericho, on the side of the road, a blind beggar called Tim's son was begging. When Tim's son heard that Yeshua was near, he started shouting, Hey, Yeshua! King David's son! Over here! Please have mercy on me! Yeshua stopped and he ordered someone to call the blind man over. The message was passed on to Tim's son. Get up! He wants to see you! This could be a lucky day. Tim's son threw aside the ragged coat that he had used to get sympathy as a beggar, stood up and came to Yeshua. So what is it that you want me to do for you? I want you to help me to see, Lord! Your faith made it possible. You can leave now. And just like that, the man received his sight, but he did not leave. No, he too joined the disciples and became a follower of Yeshua himself. 